All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's a new face here. Uh, it's Tino. And I hope you guys have had a lovely week and everything has been going great. If not, the Lord is with you. Uh, so today, as we get into the word, we're just going to, I don't know if you want to give this a topic, maybe righteousness versus holiness. Um, but Basically, I think I want to mainly emphasize on the holiness part of it. We just need the righteousness um, understanding so that the holiness one makes sense. So, if we can get into the word. Um, first off the bat, I just want to define the word righteousness or what it means to be right. And what it means to be right over all the sources that I read through, um, it basically had the same sentiment of being right or one who is right with God or um, one who is justified before God. So, if we read in the Bible, there's going to be quite a lot of verses and quite a lot of scripture so that it explains what I, what I want to say. Um, if we go into the Bible, we can look into 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, which reads, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. So, off the bat, we can see that it's Jesus who makes us right. It's Jesus who allows us to be the righteousness of God. We don't do righteousness. It's not us. It's not the good works we do. It's not me giving money to someone on the street. It's not me feeding um, a relative of mine. I, that doesn't even account to my righteousness. So I just really want that to, to be put across right now and be the basis of this, that righteousness is not us. It's not our doing. It's not our efforts. It's nothing um, that we have to do with it. So when we look at righteousness, then if Jesus is the one who makes us right, because he's the only one who can, how does he do it? And it's through his blood. When we look um, in the Bible, Jesus is described as our chief advocate. Um, he is the one who, look, I don't know law terms, so I might be incorrect and inaccurate, but <laughs> in a court of law, there's a judge, there is the person who is uh, suing, the, yeah, who is suing the other party or yes, and then there's the one who is pleading um, either guilty or innocent, and that one usually has a lawyer. So in the court of heaven, it's like that, where Jesus is our judge, I mean, where God is our judge, seated on the throne, and Jesus is like our lawyer. And what we do when we sin, the devil comes to God and says, look, but she sinned, and look at this, and then she lied, and then she what not. And then I'm able to say, because of the grace God has granted us, I'm able to say, look, Jesus, I'm like, look, God, I'm sorry. And I plead the blood of Jesus um, for my mistakes. And that way, I am made right. So the, a right standing with God is, is, is the... It's the quality of being able to stand before God blameless. Um, you are justifiable. So by pleading the blood of Jesus, it almost puts God in a corner by saying, look, you sent your son to die for our sins, and we are made right by his blood. So please may you forgive me for my sins. And it almost puts him in a corner, and we become right and are enabled to stand before the presence of God. Right, so um, the whole chief advocate is coming from 1 John 2, verse 1 to 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Um, and then another point that I wanted to bring up, um, something there's a misconception, I would say, in the church at large, um, but it's a misconception that the, what we do here on earth is what gets us to heaven. It's not. We're not that important. We're not that great. We're not that special. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but it's not what we do that gets us to heaven. It's the one who died for us. His blood is what atones for our sins. That gives us the pass to go to heaven. If heaven were a party... Um, the, the invitation that you have is your righteousness. That's what you go with and you say, look, Jesus, I'm right. I mean, look, God, I'm righteous. I took you, I took Jesus as my Lord and personal savior and I have been cleansed and I am right because the blood of Jesus 
has made me white as snow. Um, so righteousness is our path to heaven. That's what gets us to heaven. It's not what you do. You can be a fantastic person. You can be like top tier, but whatever you do here on earth, that doesn't get you to heaven. What, what gets you to heaven is righteousness. So once we've clarified that, um, we look into Proverbs 28. This is my evidence that this is what gets us to heaven. Proverbs 12, verse 28. In the way of righteousness, there is life. Along that path is immorality. So there's eternal life with being righteousness. There's that promise that God um, set for us in the Bible, that it is the righteousness of God that, uh, that gets us to heaven. And then we look, uh, I found a really cool scripture, Romans 6 verse 18, which says, you have been set free from this sin, sorry, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So um, it's quite an interesting, ironic scripture because, because we are mortal men, because we are, we are flesh, we are slaves to sin. Our flesh makes us slaves to sin. Um, we, if we see something we like, we automatically almost like lust after, after it. Without even thinking about it, it's something that the flesh does. But because we are born again in Jesus, um, we're born again in Christ, when we, when we look at it, it's like our, we've become new people. And, you know, our old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And it's now that we are slaves to righteousness. So it's now the, the onus is on us to allow righteousness to be our master. We have to answer to righteousness. It, righteousness is something that we practice. It's an everyday practice because when I sin, if I sin, I have to automatically recognize that it's wrong and own up to my master and be like, yes, I've sinned and I need to be cleansed again. So that's the one bit of righteousness. That's what I wanted to explain on righteousness. Oh, now on to holiness, which is the second part of this. Um, when we look at holiness, let us look at the description of it, um, the meaning of it. It is being set apart, uh, which is the irony of this because we've just completed the series being set apart and it talks about how we're set apart, why, uh, what does it do? And the basis of this um, topic is mainly uh, covered in that series. So I just want to touch on a few things um, in relation to the world we're living right now with holiness. So if holiness is being set apart for God and it's being consecrated for Christ, um, then it then goes to say that Jesus is the only one who makes us holy and holiness is almost like a habitual thing. So to be set apart, it's, a, it's not just today I am set apart, but like on a Sunday I'm set apart, I go to church, unlike some of the people in this nation. And then during the week, we are out here having my faro, you know. Set, being set apart, it's a habit, it's a lifestyle. Holiness is a lifestyle. So it's a behavioral thing. Righteousness is it's immediate. It's the inner workings of God. It's receiving Christ and being cleansed after repentance. Um, so it's an immediate thing. Even if you are, you know, giving your life to Christ in the, in the club, it's an immediate thing, you're cleansed. How you then walk on therefore, if therefore is then attesting to your holiness, it's then your active effort to be set apart. So when we look at holiness, a scripture that I really like was Ephesians 2 verse 12 to 13. And it reads, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from any relationship with him. Mind you, this is the amplified version. So I, it's very amplified and it really stresses the point. So we were ex excluded from any relationship with him, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, with no share in the messianic promise and without knowledge of God's agreements having no hope in his promise, and living in the world without God. But now at this very moment, in Christ Jesus, you who once were so very far away from God have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So it's the blood that gets us to right standing. It's the blood that enables us to stand before God. Um, but uh, what, what gets us, what keeps us going, is then our active efforts to be different. We are different. 
you can't be the same as someone who's, who hasn't accepted Christ as their personal savior. It can't. It's like I'm trying to be, um, it's like me trying to be my friend who's from a different household, different parents, raised differently. It can't work. And as Christians, I feel like something that's something that we, we really struggle with where you want to be like people of this world. You, you want to be socially accepted. You want to be, you know, nice to society. But you're different. And that's something we have to know. It's a fact. And embrace. And walk in that difference. Um, an example in the Bible of people who are set apart were the Israelites. And the Israelites, in my opinion, were set apart so that God, okay, God set them apart and chose them so that when other nations looked at them, they would be like, this nation is so cool. Their God must be really God. And the things that God did for them as a nation, they won almost all their battles unless they were on the other side. But they won almost all their battles. God was consistently coming through for them as a nation. They would, you know, walk through the desert in Exodus, no, in Dentron. It's a verse in the Bible. But it says, For 40 years their clothes did not wear off, neither did their shoes wear out. And that's just 40 years walking in the wilderness. Musango and their shoes didn't, and their shoes didn't wear out or, or, or tear off. And that's just a testament to how God was so faithful to them because he chose them. He set them apart. And when other nations would look at them, would hear their prayers, they would be like, wow, these people, this nation is different. Um... And that's almost like us, where God has chosen us. We are a chosen generation. And the point is that when people look at us, they want to be like us. Now, the problem is that most Christians are so terrible. Our mouths are full of scripture, but our hearts are so full of hate. And that's just not the way. When people look at Christians, they'll be like, I don't like going to church because, you know, just the people there are just so terrible, so judgmental, always talking, always gossiping, always lying. And we've become the worst people in society because we're not understanding the foundation of our Christianity that is love. Um, and that's we have to walk in love. We're different in that our mandate is to love. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, the Israelites once were like, you know, this whole being different thing is not our thing. It's not our thing at this time. So let's try be like another nation and have an actual ruler. Now for the Israelites, when God chose them, he was like, I will directly rule you. I will be your authority. Um, and then he would speak through prophets and then he would, yeah. And then the, the word of what God was said, um, would spread throughout the nation. But there was a time when the Israelites were like, nah, this is not it, chief. And then they asked God, yo, God, we want an actual ruler. And God was like, are you sure? And they're like, yes, we want one. And God was like, fine. And that's how King Saul came to be. And the pro when, when King Saul was there, at first they're like, oh, this is so cool. We're like all the other nations. But in that um, trying to be twins or in that trying to, to neglect your difference, there's pain. As time went on, Saul revealed himself to be so terrible. He was so terrible, so hard. He was just mean. He was not a nice person. And the Israelites really, really suffered under the hand of Saul. And it's, sometimes it's like that with Christianity. When we want to be the same, we want to. It's like a university student wanting to party it up with, um, with, with locals. And then you do something illegal. Your punishment will not be the same as a local. If I'm in a land that's not mine, um, my punishment will be severe because they know this. Uh, you know the authorities of that land know this is not this is not the place you are meant to be. This is not your home country. You're going somewhere. There's a somewhere else which is your home. So when you do something wrong, our penalty sometimes is is even worse than a person here on earth. If we lie, we can be beaten by our parents because you lied. Other, parents, and other people, other children, their parents are like, you could have lied like this and you could have said these words. But because this is not our home country, sometimes the penalty of wanting to be the same is really, really, really severe. So we have to celebrate our difference. We are different and that's that. Um, and then when we look into holiness, um, something that, you know, that really gets us as Christians, like I was saying, that we're not liked. 
We need to get to a point where if someone looks at you, they see how you're such a good person, and when you and they ask, how are you so amazing? And you're able to answer, this is the influence of Christ in me. And your life has to be a testimony. Your life is what the world sees. Um, you know, it says in the Bible, God looks, I mean, people look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. People look at the outward appearance. People see you walking through the shop and like not helping the older, like the elderly. People see that and they're like, oh, okay, they're just like the other regular people. But when you help other people, when you give, when you just live such a nice life, people question, how are you so lovely? And you're able to testify and bring people to Christ because of the way you live. Um, so the onus is really on us, eh? Um, and then when we look into holiness, things that really challenge our holiness, would, the th two things I would like to talk about. The other things are a bit deeper, and those are for another chat. Um, but the tolerance, um, one, of the, one of the things that challenge our holiness as Christians is tolerance. Where we are just saying, you know, this is cool. Like, you know, you take a teaching from there. And then you take a doctrine from this side of the world. And then you, you like how this country does this. And then you, you take and you, 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 you're, you're allowing different doctrines from social media to then determine what you think, um, how you see things, and you know your moral compass. And the Bible is there because it's a guide to, you, to how we live here on earth. And... What the Bible then says, and it has specific rules and, you know, the, the, the prevalence and the importance of the Old Testament, that's another big topic, and that's for another day. But what I want to talk about is that we have, we're set apart because there's certain rules that we must follow. There's a certain conduct we must uphold um, as Christians. And the way the Bible tells us to think is the way we should think. Um, we are told to see lying as bad. And that's how it should be because that's how, that's, those are the people we are. We are Christians. And it's not so that you can go to someone else and say, hey, you, I saw you lying, so you're bad. No, it's so that the way you live, okay, the rules that are in the Bible are to influence the way you live so that if someone sees it, they'll be like, this is cool. Um, so holiness is really the horizontal part of the cross. It's how people then see you. It's your behavior after righteousness. Um, and then another thing that I'd like to talk about is freedom of choice. Now, I hope I'll explain this correctly because there is free will, but then there's, uh, there's something that society has sold us as this most beautiful gift called freedom of choice. You can do whatever you want, whenever you want it, and um, it's fine. The thing with freedom of choice is, if I choose that in a traffic jam, I want to get where I want to be um, faster, I could be a reckless driver and weave through the traffic jam, putting other drivers at risk. So yes, it is my choice, and I want to get to where I want to get um, quicker, but it then affects other people in the, in the race, in the, in, the, in the road. So freedom of choice is not really a thing. I'd like to think of it as a myth because everything you do affects the other person. And then in Christianity, the thing is, yes, you're, you're living for yourself and yes, you're an individual, but you're also representing Christ. You're also part of the body of Christ. So as much as I want to do whatever I want to do, if my, f okay, if my, if the, if the, if the nerves in my finger decide they just don't want to work, um, you know, they just, today's an off day, I just don't want to work and I get burnt. It not only affects my nerves, but it affects my blood vessels, it affects my skin. It's, it's just like that in the body of Christ where you're accountable to the body. It says if the hand does not do what the hand is supposed to do, it affects the functioning of the whole body. So this whole you want to do whatever you want to do at the time you want to do it, there is free will, and there is, it, it, I, all I'm saying, it has to be in reason. It has to be, you can't be a cancer to the body of Christ. Don't be a cancer to the body of Christ. So that's about it on holiness. Um, and I hope we've understood that it's really just about trying to show Jesus and allowing our lives to preach the gospel. 
Sometimes you don't have to say it. Sometimes just the way you are in a shop is someone's key to salvation. If you decide you want to steal, someone will be like, oh, this person, nah. But if you do something cool in a shop, this is a very trivial example, but if you do something like you help an old woman push her trolley or you just compliment the cashier and be like, your dress is really nice today. Um, someone can really come up to you and be like, oh, like you're such a great, like you're such a cool person. What's your name? What's a, what, are, what are you about? And that's someone's key to salvation. So as much as we want to, you know, live our independent lives, earth is temporary. We can't let temporary things on earth determine our goal. Because like a university student in a foreign land, yes, I'm in that foreign land, but I'm there until I get my degree. Once I'm done, I'm back home. I'm going home. I'm from home. Um, and I can't change where I'm from. You can't change that you're set apart. You can't, you, it's something to be celebrated. Um, so there's that. And I think that's the end of our preach. I hope you guys have a lovely week. Do follow us on our social media pages um, at FM The Bridge on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, subscribe to this channel. Send your number to one of the leaders so that you can be added to the updates groups if you're not. And yeah, hope you have a blessed week, everyone. See you next time.